Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Alrighty, folks, thank you for coming back to another episode, and if you're new, welcome to the show. Today, we are listening to Lee Schultz, and he's going to talk about how to understand cattle market trends and how to leverage that understanding in a way that's going to help you as a cattle producer be more profitable. And before we dive into this episode, I want to remind you all that I am booking for speaking gigs here. So if you are looking for a workshop presenter, a keynote speaker, a panel speaker, whatever it may be, I am open to discussing anything from podcasting, entrepreneurship, rural business, and even some advocacy. That's actually what I speak the most on is how to advocate. So with that, you can email me at casualcattleconversations at gmail.com. And that link is also in the show notes. But with that, let's hear from Lee. Well, Lee, good morning. And thank you for joining me on the show today. I guess it might not be morning for listeners, depending on when they are tuning into this. So today we're going to be talking about kind of the trends in the cattle markets and the cattle cycle in general and kind of what that means for cattle producers today. For those of you out there listening, I do want to put a little bit of a disclaimer on there that we are recording this the end of May, just so you're aware of the time frame of when we're recording and having this conversation. But Lee, thank you again. And to start off, I mean, I know you're an Iowa State guy. So would you kind of talk a little bit about what you're doing in the beef industry today, what your role is, and uh, what your career looks like? Sure. Well, thanks again for for having me on. Uh, uh, So here at Iowa State, I have a little bit of a unique role. Um, I have a three-way split. Uh, So what that means is part of my time is dedicated to teaching. So we, we teach an agricultural marketing course where we let students really dig into futures and options and, and cash markets to really understand some of the markets uh, that they participate in as you know their, their families' operations, as well as where they may be going in the industry. Uh, then another part of my job is, is research. So that is really um, taking a look at, you know, a lot of times the, the hot issues in the marketplace you know, so a lot of the work I've done over the last couple of years is related to price discovery, um, market resiliency, as, as we talked about impacts of COVID-19. And then the largest part of my job is extension. And so that's what I think we're going to talk a lot about today is really understanding the markets. So the real fun stuff, right, of understanding where we are, where we may be going and how we can maybe better, better position ourselves uh, as we're entering different parts of, of the marketplace. Um, And so I've been here at Iowa State for uh, going on 11 years. Um, So I, you know, interestingly, we're going to talk about the cattle cycle. You know, I've seen two cattle cycles now, or at least, you know, parts of of two cattle cycles. So we can kind of borrow um, some intuition and and what's happened over the last several years, but also understanding that no two cattle cycles are alike. So we're going to have to tailor, you know, a lot of the discussion and and, um, opportunities and, and, um, you know, threats maybe as we go forward, understanding that this 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 situation is going to look a little bit different than it maybe has in the past. Well, I appreciate you saying that no two cattle cycles are alike, but can you talk a little bit about what a traditional cattle cycle looks like to give everyone just a basic background on that? Sure. So at the heart of it, I think we need to remember that cattle production, like any other business is a competitive industry, right? So this means that long run economic profits are going to gravitate towards zero. That's not accounting profits, but economic profits are going to be very narrow in in the long run. And what that means is producers are going to expand when they see profits. And by expanding, they're going to bid away the profits in the industry, going to trend towards zero. And then you're going to see some losses, maybe on average, and that's going to trigger some expansion or some contraction, and that's going to give rise to this cattle cycle. So usually we talk about cattle cycles, um, either production, uh, so inventory numbers or beef production or prices. And so when supplies are, are tight, you're going to see higher prices. When supplies are, are plentiful, uh, you're going to see lower prices, right? This has been along forever, but as I mentioned, you know, no two cattle cycles are alike. We've, we've actually seen a flattening of the cattle cycle over time. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, One big reason is we produce more beef 
from a single cow than we historically have, right? We're much more efficient. We feed cattle to heavier weights. Uh, and so that has really mitigated some of the, the large swings in cattle numbers. And that means that when we're in, in, a, in a period of expansion, we don't need as many cows as we historically did to get a bump in beef, beef production. Similarly, we don't need as much contraction to get a decline in beef production. That, you know, as I mentioned, kind of gives us a flatter cattle cycle over time. So talk a little bit about what we're seeing today then in the cattle cycle and what that's really meaning for beef producers. Because a lot of what I'm seeing is, you know, a lot of states are still in drought. There's concerns there. There's been, drought's been impacting us for a few years. So what are you kind of seeing and what what does that mean for the cow-calf producer today? Well, I'll, we'll focus in on the national level and then we can talk a little bit about regional impact. So as we look at the current cattle inventory cycle, so if we measure it from low or trough to trough, uh, the current cycle began in 2014. So remember, many of us remember 2014, right? We had come off a regional drought in 2011, a national drought in 2012, a higher feed costs, lower forage base available because of the drought, and we we uh, culled numbers to, to to lows of 50 years, right? And so uh, we seen tight supplies in that period, and that triggered with strong demand a large expansionary period. And so we seen inventories then peak in 2019. Um, and we've seen our, our national inventories decline uh, since that time. Now, most cattle cycles run nine to 14 years. Well, if you do the math, we're at nine years right now, um, and we're nowhere near the end of this current cattle cycle. So what that means is this cattle cycle is going to run longer uh, on the longer end of that nine to 14 years. And so we're in a period of, of further contraction in, in the cattle uh, industry. Part of that, we have to realize that we have to really get tighter before you get larger because of the, the need to retain more heifers. So even when we start to see full-fledged expansion, uh, that heifers, we're gonna pull those from, from uh, the cattle inventory that, that's going for beef supply. Well, that's gonna tighten up supplies e even more. Uh, now, you know, I think you mentioned, you know, we have drought impacts. And if you look at the drought monitor, you know, some regions have gotten better, some have actually gotten worse. You know, I just looked at Iowa's uh, drought monitor, and we actually compared to, to this time last year, we're actually a little bit worse nationally, or a little bit worse in aggregate when, when you look at, at Iowa. So obviously regional impacts matter. Um, and that's why I think is if you look at Back a couple of years ago, um, Iowa, we actually added beef cows um, January 1, 2021 compared to January 1, 2020. Well, the reason is we were one of the only places that really had grass available, right? And so I think as you've seen places like South Dakota see a lot of uh, contraction because of less forage available, actually more cows physically came to Iowa. So you can see um, some situations where we maybe don't fit the cattle cycle in a particular year, but in aggregate, those numbers are going to vary in that, that uh, trough to trough and, and period that we talked about. So part of the reason, or really the main reason I wanted to have you on to speak about cattle cycles, um, the markets in general, is because as beef producers, with us shifting more towards that business mindset, we really want to profit and margins have been tight. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about your article. Let's see what profits entice cattle producers to expand to capture more profits, I believe, right? That's the title. <laughs> so you, I was reading through that and you mentioned to hope for the best, but plan for the worst with where cattle markets are right now. Can you kind of expand on what you mean by that? Sure. So, so there's a lot to maybe unpack from there. Um, so first, I think, and foremost, is understanding producers respond to profits and not prices, right? And that's a very important distinction to make. So if you look at current prices, uh, at least from a nominal standpoint, we won't go into debating, you know, uh, adjusting for inflation, but nominally, these are some of the best prices we've ever had, right? And so an outsider looking in may say, well, with these prices, 
we would see large expansion in the industry. But when we look at where costs are, costs are as high as they've ever been. So that means that profits are actually pretty modest right now. Um, and there may be some producers that are not even making money at these very high prices because their, their cost situation is such. So I always talk about it, you know, there's things that producers may want to do right now. Um, I would want to expand in a, you know, increasing market, but I may not be able to do that because of my current situation as it relates to costs, or, you know, I may still be dealing with a drought, you know, in my current, current region. So that's limited my, my ability now. So as we think about um, expanding going forward, you know, I think we need to really take a, a calculated approach uh, because understanding that uh, when we're looking at, at the current cattle market, we, we expect prices to go higher, right? But that may, may really um, want us to expand. And, and we've seen this back in 2014, right? With the levels of replacement heifer prices, um, you know, those are some of the highest replacement heifer prices we've ever seen. And at those current prices, they would pencil out. Uh, but we've seen rather quickly that prices eroded pretty quickly. Uh, and those replacement heifer prices probably didn't make, even make sense over the life of, of that investment. So I think as we think about staring at this current cattle market and rel relatively strong prices, I think we have to understand that, you know, there are some investments that will pay off over the life of that investment. Um, but there may be some that, that may not, um, just because we need to take an outlook on the cattle market and I think give a, maybe a, a conservative approach when we think about where prices could go. So that's why I always like to, to talk to producers of, you know, when you are you know, thinking about investments, run a lot of sensitivity analysis, right? Give me the best case scenario, give me the worst case scenario, and it's probably gonna be somewhere in between, right? And if that investment makes sense under the worst case scenario, it's a no brainer, right? But a lot of times I think we benchmark off the best case scenario, um, you know, and then markets change for various reasons. And then we see that investment um, not be as profitable as maybe we expected. So then what do they need to be analyzing within the markets to make, to help figure those best and worst case scenarios and make sure that those investments do or don't pay off in the long run? Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we've changed a bit of the, the calculus on this because of, of interest rates, right? So, you know, interest rates went from something historically low uh, to interest rates that, that are much higher now, right? Than, than many of us have, have really experienced, right? And so, you know, that changes the math on, on quite a bit of this. Um, what, what I think of when I'm, you know, thinking about investments in, in the cattle industry or, or changing is you know understanding what my risks really are. So um, as a as a younger cattle producer, or someone that's maybe very highly leveraged, um, they can't potentially sustain you know large swings in the in the cattle market. So you know I'll take us back to 2014. So let's learn a little bit from from this last cattle cycle, right? So you've seen feedlot producers um, making you know anywhere from you know, two, three hundred, three hundred dollars per head in October, November of 2014, right? They were paying really high prices for feeder cattle, but fed cattle prices were really strong, right? Now you look a year later and producers maybe were losing four hundred dollars per head. Uh, and that's because we had seen prices being bid up for those feeder cattle. Um, and then we had an unexpected price slump starting in the summer of 2015. Um, and so you look at it, paying high prices and all of a sudden your output prices relatively collapse. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of risk in this market. Uh, we have price risk management tools to help take care of some of that risk. So we have futures, we have options. Um, you know, there's been uh, federally inspected or federally supported livestock insurance since 2003. Uh, we've made some adjustments to those insurance products starting July 1, 2022. That's made them a little bit more attractive. So, you know, I think anytime we think about large changes in the cattle cycle, so we are certainly, um, you know, in a downturn of the inventories, 
prices are going higher. There's a lot of revenue at stake, right? So we need to talk about and think about price risk management um, and how it can help me really sustain a certain level of, of profits in, in the market. Hey folks, I wanna take a quick second to talk about a company that's truly helping beef producers advance their herds. Vitelli is the most accessible, reliable, and predictable reproductive solution. Operating in 21 countries with 15 global IVF labs, Vitelli is setting the new standard in bovine reproduction. Vitelli's simple, innovative, hormone-free IVF system allows you to multiply more of your best genetics faster. In the U.S., the 30-plus satellite partners and seven regional labs makes it easier for you as a producer to access Vitelli's technology. Once you find a location near you, all you need to do is bring your cow. That's right. There is no donor setup or added labor. Their hormone-free process is easier on the cattle and simpler for you. Grade 1 embryos are created in the lab to the mating of your choice and their simple, outcome-based pricing structure ensures you only pay for the embryo produced. Visit their website, www.vitelli.com, that's V-Y-T-E-L-L-E.com, to see how Vitelli can ensure your herd is always progressing, and that link is also in the show notes. So I'm curious about risk management since you brought it up. I know that wasn't going to be the main topic, but you, you, you mentioned it. So I want to ask a question about it. What are some risk management options outside of like your LRP insurance? Like what, what are you seeing producers do to manage risk outside of turning to insurance? Sure. And so, you know, I, I would, um, turn that around maybe a little bit. You know, I think um, the insurance products offer a lot of opportunity. Um, and we Absolutely. haven't seen, you know, historically a lot of risk there. So, you know, that's where I really, as I'm giving market outlook talks and price risk management talks, you know, I'm encouraging producers to take a look at some of those, um, you know, insurance products. We also have, you know, the traditional products of futures markets, um, options, you know, buying put options to help put a price floor, you know, on our, on our current market. You know, when we think about price risk management, uh, this is one of the hardest topics to teach in an increasing market, right? Because what do producers um, always, you know, benchmark against is the highest price possible. So, you know, if I am to, you know, put a price floor in or hedge a price or buy livestock insurance and, and you know, put a floor price in or, or certain margin, uh, and then I see prices go higher, I think, well, I left a bunch of money on the table, right? But that's what that's not what price risk management's about, right? It's about mitigating losses and large losses, it, be it at that. So I think that's the mindset we have to a little bit have uh, when we think about price risk management. Now, we can certainly tailor our strategies to where the market's currently at. So, you know, as we're in, a, in, a, in an increasing market, I think you want to leave the upside available, right? So something like LRP or put options allow for, you know, increasing markets and to take advantage of that as, opposing to, as opposed to hedging a, a particular price. Absolutely. There, every tool has their place. I just, I hear a lot of people, you know, talk about some of the insurance options. So sometimes that's why I ask the question. I like to see, you know, what else is out there too, but they all definitely have their place. So, and, and definitely have their place for, for each individual producer, right? So, you know, I always remind folks, be, com be comfortable with the tools that you're using and understand what worked last year is not going to work this year. And what works for your neighbor may not work for you. So that's, you know, being really knowledgeable, um, you know, if that's something that, that, you know, isn't necessarily in your wheelhouse, you know, working with someone that helps manage that price risk is very important. Well, it's all about having a great team. That's something that I talk about quite a bit on the show because we can't be an expert in everything and cattle producers, they are certainly jacks of all trades as it is. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how you know, margins are tight. We're trying to make a profit. And you talked a little bit about, you know, where we're at with the markets where yes, prices are high, but costs are still also high. So that margin's still tight. I, you mentioned in your article, you talked a little bit about expansion and when to, and not to make the decision to expand. So can you kind of talk a little bit more and expand on 
you know, even though prices are up, when is it or isn't it the right decision to put those profits back into the business and expand? So, you know, I, I always sometimes start this discussion with, uh, you know, there's two basic principles here, right? First, buy low and sell high and find out what everyone else is doing and doing the opposite, right? So if you can successfully do those, um, you're likely going to be more profitable. But I say that jokingly because um, that, that's a difficult strategy to, to follow, right? Um, especially the, the buy low and sell high. If everyone could do it, everyone would make a lot of money, right? So I think it, it's really, um, you know, understanding uh, some approaches that, that could, you can take to maybe um, have the market work, work for you, right? So, you know, one, one approach that, you know, my, my predecessor did quite a bit of work on is understanding investment strategies. And, and some of the work that, that he found is that, you know, you can think about like dollar cost averaging. So I'm spending the same amount on replacement heifers regardless of, of where the market's at. So instead of replacing the same number of heifers every year, some years they're gonna cost a lot more, some years they're gonna cost a lot less, I'm gonna spend the same dollar amount, right? So when replacement heifer prices are relatively low, that means I'm gonna buy more replacement heifers, right? And when they're really high, I may, I'm gonna buy fewer replacement heifers. But what that means is, I'm gonna actually target the market a little bit better because I'm gonna have more replacement heifers and cows to market calves at higher prices due to the biology related to that cattle cycle. Um, and so that'll help me time that market a little bit better. Now let's think back to that last cattle cycle. So when we seen really large profits in cow calf production last, last time was 2014, 2015. What happened? Replacement heifer prices went through the roof, right? There was a lot of demand for those replacement heifers because of the profitability that was going on in the industry. Well, let's think about the calves from those replacement heifers. What kind of market was I marketed into? Some of the lowest calf prices that we've seen, right? Because we, we've seen that expansion, that full-fledged expansion take place. Um, we bid away those profits and then we see much tighter prices. And that's where I'm marketing th those calves from those very high replacement heifers. So I think that's really important to, to keep in mind of, you know, there's ability to, um, I think, tailor some strategies to time this market a little bit better. Another way is if you think about it, um, and I wrote an article maybe six months ago to say, well, you know, you may look at older cows right now that are available because that helps me speed it up a little bit quicker to have a calf available as opposed to, you know, raising or buying a replacement heifer um, that's going to take a little bit longer to get a calf mm -hmm. from. And so there, you know, the case was, you know, I think some of those, those cows um, were undervalued a little bit and I could take an older cow, get a couple calves out of her, and that would time out really well where we're going to see some of the highest calf prices in the next couple of years. So if a cattle producer out there is listening to this podcast and they really want to say, I want to manage for profitability, I want to make sure that I'm keeping an open mind and watching the markets, you know, what is one of the biggest things they can do to manage for profitability? I think it's making sure an investment fits with the long-term business plan, right? So um, and in that article you mentioned, you know, I, we talk about when we see high profits, we see investment, investment, investment. Um, and then when that profitability wanes, we see liquidation, 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 and unfortunately on a lower market typically. So, you know, I think you think you got to think about um, decisions, how they're going to impact expenses, cash flow, debt, and investment, um, and then get into some specifics. So think about investments that have really high expected payoffs. So this can include cattle genetics, uh, improving the forage base, either quantity and or quality, uh, making repairs, um, expanding infrastructure, acquiring productive assets, investing in technology that's gonna pay off over the long run and making some tweaks in, in production activity. So, you know, in economics, we talk a lot about ensuring marginal benefits equal or exceed marginal costs. Right. So making sure my inputs are having the biggest impact on my, my outputs. 
Uh, and then a big payback is always reducing debt, right? Now, that's a little bit more difficult if depending on when that debt was incurred, right? And where the interest rates were. Um, because you know that's be, may be some of the cheapest money that I've ever that I've ever gotten in the form of debt. So, uh, but again, typically that's been a large payoff is is in reducing uh, debt for for the operation. So, as we kind of wrap up today, what final thoughts or advice would you like to share with all the cow calf producers out there who are trying to be proactive and understand what's going on in the cattle markets? Well, I think, you know, as you mentioned, um, certainly working with your team of experts uh, is, is critically important. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot gets made about, you know, um, really dialing in um, and making important decisions uh, in, in bad times, right? But as we're in relatively good times in the cattle industry, I think some of those decisions that are made now collectively with your team of experts are gonna be some of the most important decisions that, that you make, right? Because that's gonna set you up for the next um, downturn in, in cattle prices, which will likely be tighter profits in the industry. And so I think you gotta think about how you can set yourself up uh, for that, that situation coming forward. Also, I, you know, I remind folks, um, and this is hard to do, I think, <laughs> as we talk about some cattle producers, is that, you know, enjoy a, a, a prosperous cattle market. So, you know, as we think about, you know, where to invest some of these profits, um, personal use is part of that, right? So, you know, that may be in line with, you know, some operational goals is taking advantage of, of a prosperous market. A lot of times that obviously comes after, you know, prioritizing a lot of some of the investments, um, you know, in, in, the, in the cattle operation. Alrighty, Lee. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the show today and really sharing your knowledge with all the listeners out there today. Well, thank you for having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.